Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back to some more bite-sized business advice. And this episode, I have been secretly looking forward to for months. Uh, This is a person who I have had on my radar. I followed him on LinkedIn, seen the success and growth of his company. Quite honestly, I couldn't believe it, which is why I kind of had to reach out and have this interview. So uh, we're going to dive into franchising, growing a company, very rapidly. And that is all with the CEO of Voda and Franchise Playbook, Dan Claps. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you for having me, Brandon. And that uh, that makes two of us with the not being able to believe it. I wake up every morning thinking that and just trying to continue to make sure that uh, we continue to grow the company in the right direction. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. So let me, let's just add some context here because you just shared with me before we started recording numbers that I couldn't wrap my head around. You've been a franchise for about a year and you have 85 locations, you have 85 territories sold at this point. That's, that's absurd. That's gotta be one of the fastest growing franchises in the market today. Am I wrong? Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's an interesting statistic in franchising. um, It typically takes a brand 10 years to get to a 100 units, 100 units, 10 years, and only 3% of brands ever reach the 100 unit mark. So it's 100 units, 3%, 10 years. And uh, we're fortunate to have hit 85 within our first year. We'll be at 100 territories uh, very soon. Uh, More importantly, franchise owners, we have about 40 franchise owners that have multiple, you know, territories and locations. Um, And so, you know, we've, we've definitely come into this with aggressive growth, but we also structured the company before ever starting to be able to support these, this many franchise locations. We had staff in place. We're gonna have to do the magic of editing. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, you froze there for a little bit. Um, We'll just hang on. Let me let me just check that there's a good connection oh. here. Still hear me? I think we'll have a good connection. All right. Well, we'll see what happens, right? Yeah. All right. We'll edit um, this out. Um, all right. So that's that's very impressive. I do have a I have a history in franchising. Um, I actually turned one of my former companies into a franchise. So I'm aware of those stats. Uh, it's absurd, which is again, adding to why I had to have this conversation. But I also want to unpack the other side of it, which you you hit on is you had the company set up for for this massive growth and success. So I want to I want to kind of unpack that and see where you've been along this journey and what you guys did. You are not just to clarify for the listener, as in your words, you're not the founder of Voto, you are the finder, which is uh, an awesome way to put it. But what did you do when you took over as CEO and when this company turned into a franchise? Like, what were some of those things that you had to have in place to make sure that not only you could sell franchises, but that those people would then be successful in running their own individual companies? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'd I'd love to hear at one point about your franchise journey. But um, I've been in the franchise space for a decade. And so a lot of our success, which is... uh, is happening fast. I feel is 10 years in the making. Um, I started out, um, little story. I started out in, in college in the staffing space. I had a staffing business. It was more of a job than a business in my early twenties. I wanted to sell that. It wasn't even anything you could sell. It was just a job. My dad said, why don't you look at franchises? I started looking at franchises because they were all about building systems and processes. And I was looking at home services because at one point I sold Kirby vacuum cleaners door to door as a, as a team, which is ironic because it was uh, it's a floor cleaning business or, or, or product. And home services was all about creating a better customer service experience. So I thought home service franchises made sense. This was back in 2014. 
And at that time, I probably just didn't have the, enough capital. <clears throat> it's funny. I actually remember being in my early 20s. I didn't even have a printer. And they were sending me documents. And I'm like, you know, probably not ready to, to own a franchise. But I ended up getting into a franchise in um, called Murphy Business and Financial, which teaches you how to help people buy and sell businesses. So I became a, a business broker in that franchise. And that was my first experience as a, you know, in franchising. Um, I had a great experience. I was successful at it, but about a year and a half in, I looked in the mirror and realized that if I didn't pick up the phone or show up to a listing, that I didn't make money. And that's not really a business. You know, Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad Poor Dad, talks about you've got employees, this owner, and oh, did I freeze again? Oh. You're good. I got you. Robert Kiyosaki talks about you've got, you know, uh, employee, self employed business owner and investor. And I was self-employed again. And honestly, I'd rather be an employee if I'm going to be self-employed or, or, or a business owner. Um, Cause you're working crazy hours, you're not building an asset. And so kind of looked in the mirror, realized I was doing the same thing twice, same mistake twice. And I realized that what I was really good at was lead generation and the franchise order didn't really do a ton to do that or help with that. And, you know, so I ended up starting a lead generation company in the franchise space with a previous business partner back in 2016. We did that for seven years, built a lot of relationships and that business was acquired by private equity. But what's funny, Brandon, is looking back in the rear view mirror, because I was selling leads in the franchise space, I was at every single conference you can imagine. I had every CEO and founder of a franchise brand talking to me, not because I'm some amazing conversations, but because they wanted my leads. And looking back, I basically had these seven years and 10 years total of just learning franchising and learning what to do. And so that's kind of the backstory. And then just to finish the, the answer to your question, um, I basically, when I exited my previous business, um, a natural progression was to be a franchisor. I love helping people become a business owner, but I pretty quickly realized I didn't know what the heck I was doing as a franchisor. And that's really where my business partner, our COO and his, his co-founder, Zach Nolte came into play because he's an operations franchisor expert that came in. And I remember our conversation was me saying, hey, go home, write out everything you would have done differently as the president of your previous brand. And let's start from there. That's awesome. I, I love that. I love that you recognize that, too, because I think one of my problems with uh, franchises, brands as a whole and the industry is it's kind of sold as this get rich quick model which I mean, you know, it's not. And I think, I think anyone with a brain knows it's not either, but people go into franchising when they just want to have more of their company, when they want to duplicate their brand. That's one of the most common paths. The other path that sounds like you took is you wanted to give business ownership to other people and you wanted to systematize it and make it actually something other people could have and run in their own territory. So unpack that for me a little bit, because what did it take for you be willing to duplicate this model and be confident with it before you sold it to somebody else, knowing, or at least what I'm hearing is you didn't so much care about getting rich quick from it as a franchisor, you wanted it to be a sustainable model. Well, certainly not. Certainly not as far as getting rich quick because the franchisor is the most expensive business. I think you could start outside of software. Um, but, you know, for me, it was... Um, you know, we, we, we invested several millions of dollars into the infrastructure of Voda. And really, you know, it comes down to having first a cohesive leadership team. So we built out, we had our COO and co-founder, his name is Zach. We have our CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. His name is Christian. He was part of Anytime Fitness. He was managing a $50 million a year ad budget for franchisees. Very smart, had his own business in marketing and had been part of several brands in, in franchising. Um and then our VP of development, Steve Miller, who came into the company very early in. And I'll never forget, we launched Franchise Playbook before having even the knowledge of which brand we were going to, which industry we were going to go into. And I remember being at a family barbecue and them saying, like, who are all these people you're hiring? You have a CMO and a see that and a see this. You don't even have a business. And for me, building the team was the first, uh, you know, Steve Jobs says it best. Like, he didn't build the, uh, the you know, the iPod he built the team that built the iPod. And so we put a lot of money into those salaries and, and teammates that are not cheap. Um, and then we invested in technology and then we invested in, you know, 
hiring layers beneath those leaders. Again, before we ever had a franchise owner, we had a success coach ready to train franchisees. We had a marketing director ready to uh, champion the messages that Christian had put out. Like we set everything up before we started, but then the story takes this little step further. I'd like to quickly share, which centers around, um, I'm convinced that almost every time something goes wrong, it's you. Um, you know, people don't fail, systems fail. And, you know, we basically, I'll never forget, we put all this money into Voda. There was all this buzz. You know, we're, we planned it from October until we launched in April. It was a long time to put everything together. And we launched in April of 2020, um, 2023. And we thought we're going to fly off the shelves. Everyone's going to love Voda. But it was actually the opposite, man. Like no one, no one wanted Voda we were having a lot of trouble getting someone in and everyone does, but we felt like, well, we spent all this money and energy and time. Why isn't anyone buying and upset about it in April and May and June when no one was buying, we just kept seeing what was missing. Like if you didn't buy, it was like, well, what, what are we missing? And we would go back to the system and fix it. But it's a personal story, but it's funny. Cause like, I'll never forget. I was, I was dating someone, a girl for three years. We were very serious. And as this business isn't selling any units, April, May, like I'm going like I'm bleeding money and, you know, we end up breaking up, not related, but just bad timing. She takes my dog. I'm sleeping on an air mattress and uh, not a bad way. We agreed for her to take it. But I was like, what the heck did I do? What did I get myself into? Um, but it's just funny because then our first person bought and then it was like a snowball effect because in franchising, franchise candidates need to hear validation and the validation was wait a minute these guys really do have it dialed in here once i bought and got into the system yeah it's that tough hurdle right like you have to you have a concept you have a playbook not to use the name of your company but you, you have a system that's sellable but no buyers and people want to see okay why well, i don't want to be the first one i don't want to get my foot necessarily wet and be the the guinea pig so that's that's interesting that it took you so long to get your first buyer. So really the growth has been even quicker than, than a year. It's been less than a year to get to 85 units, but something you said that, that I don't think a lot of people realize as, you know, even the seven, eight, nine figure business owners that, that we've worked with, if something goes wrong, it's your fault or you're in the way. I, I don't know how people get past themselves as a leader. How did you work on yourself and how did you get out of your own way? and bring in all these amazing people around you. Not that it would be your fault, but how did you just know to surround yourself with other, you know, maybe smarter people or better people in their individual role to help this company be successful? Yeah, uh, a, lot of, a lot of mistakes. So my previous business was doing several million in, in revenue and I always felt like I did a good job. I got off the org chart at the end, but never off the decision chart. And when you're off the decision chart is when I think you really have freedom. And what I mean by that is I delegated work, but not decisions. I had my hands in everything. Yeah. Um, I had my hands in everything. And we hired people that were cheaper and less qualified and not as smart as me. And when I sold the business and I looked back, I watched how private equity came in and they brought in such smart people. Uh, that was a big aha moment for me. And so um, like there was not one time that I hired anyone outside of a, a woman that's a friend of mine. She did a great job. She was on a hundred percent commission. So she was like a high caliber person and she killed it, but no one else did we ever hire. That was like, this is like a little expensive, but they're going to, they're going to be amazing. Um, and so quite frankly, with, with Voda, you know, with a little bit of, you know, cash in the bank, I guess I had a little more confidence, but, I took the absolute opposite approach, which was you get what you pay for with people as long as you understand you know, how to find the right people. Um, and so I've just centered around this idea like, you know, I don't hire people to tell them what to do. I hire them to tell me what to do. Um, and I, my biggest lesson I would say is there's a great book by Dan Martell called Buy Back Your Time. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, I don't tell people how to do things. I just say, we need this result. Um, and again, 
you can't hire someone that's not motivated, not ambitious, not smart, not a critical thinker. That's that's a given. That's the price of entry to come into the company. But if they have all those things and you empower them to say, here's the outcome. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Just go and do it. Here's the timeline. Here's some guardrails. I'm happy to coach you as like a, a sounding board, but you're responsible for the outcome. That was the biggest aha moment for me to be able to really get out of the business day to day. And then so I, one more thing would be the equity incentives, like hiring uh, key members to some type of stake in the business. Yeah, that's like a leadership masterclass right there. Two, two minutes of a leadership masterclass. Do, do that in your business. Do all of that. Um, I, I love that. So these principles that you took to grow as a franchisor and grow your both Voda and franchise playbook, how are you helping your Voda franchisees instill this mindset in, in their own companies so that they don't own a job, but they can actually build a business that doesn't require them to be the decision maker? Yeah, I love that question. Um, it's funny. My job as a leader is to provide entrepreneurs a platform to build their own business in, right? That's really what a franchise is. And people don't realize that as much as we have playbooks and systems, like it's still their own business. We can't make them do anything. We can highly encourage and, you know, maybe there's certain things that they can't do. But within reason, franchise owners are, are in a pretty large, like, you know, area that they can operate their business in with some guidelines, and so it's up to them what they do. And so getting them to want to follow your playbooks is key in getting buy-in. Um, and so for us, it starts with the item seven, which in franchising, you have a FDD, franchise disclosure document. Everyone has to sign one before they buy uh, a VOTA. And it essentially memorializes everything we've said about the business in writing and their, uh, our obligations, their obligations, our expectations, their expectations. And in that, we put our investment where we actually are on the higher end like with restoration. Um, um, and if, if someone's interested, it's uh, my vote is great. And then my vote of franchise.com is, uh, is another place to go. But um, what we did with the item seven is we, we, we put all everything we could think of in the investment. And so we really, first off, we look for franchise owners that are willing to invest in their business. And they're not just like squeaking by to buy a voter. They've got ample cash to, to build the actual business. Number two, we only bring in franchise owners that are what we call the mayor of the town. The mayor of the town, somebody that's a good networker. They love to get out there. They love people. And I say no to everyone that isn't a mayor of town to be a franchise owner. And then finally, with all of that, um, it's really just being a franchise owner. I probably shouldn't say this. It's probably not politically correct what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's a great book called Tribal Leadership. Like you know, as a franchise owner, you're building a tribe. I'd take it a step further. You're kind of building a cult. Um, of course, kidding, but like it's getting people to be so bought into the, the vision and the mission and, and the way of doing things. And so the way we've done that is, and again, it's different as a franchisor, but we, we talk with franchise owners almost every day of the week. There's a dedicated call as a company. Then they have siloed calls with their success coaches. We have teams messages flying all around. Like the amount of communication on a daily and weekly basis is so much. And then within those communication channels, video, teams, emails, calls, we just keep repeating these principles that we've learned that we just keep trying to help them. And listen, they don't all get it right away, but over time they do. Yeah. That, I mean, that's some of the most important thing is just building that community um, and supporting them along the way. It, it's not it's not the journey to buy a franchise and then see you later. It's it's support and, and building. And I love how you guys do that. Um, this is not a politically correct show. So you're you're cool with the cult reference. Um, but I agree. I think I think any business outside of just a franchise, the franchising industry, you have to build a cult. You have to build a culture that is so attractive and repulsive to people. And that's how you get the right people on your team. When, when people say either like heck yes or, or heck no to keep it PG 13, that's when you have something you can actually build on top of because you're building a culture of people who want to be there. And that's, that's amazing. So Voda, yes, that's the center of the conversation today, but the, the larger, the parent company franchise playbook, I'm, I'm really curious. I've, I've seen this model before. I think one of the ones I'm, I'm more familiar with is propelled brands for you watching, listening, um, their flagship brand would be fast signs 
um, massive brand, international brand, you want to do a similar model and take on the home services industry. So in the next three to five years, where are you taking Franchise Playbook and, and what sort of industries are you targeting to be able to do that? Yeah, great, great question. So, so once you've learned the principles of running a home services business and franchisor, there's a lot of crossover into other industries. Um, between your leadership, you can you can use the similar teammates. You've got uh, a lot of cross functionality, um, and so our vision is to have multiple brands in the platform. We want to be the largest privately held home services platform. It's very clear, very very specific. Almost all home service platforms, platform meaning bunch of brands in one company under an umbrella, um, are either owned by private equity or probably going to exit to private equity in the near future. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we want to build something a little bit longer sighted. Our decisions are around what can we do in 20 or 30 years, not five to 10 years or three to five years. And so um, just a little bit different there. Um, there's a lot of industries that relate well to restoration. And so when we feel like we've first covered most of the country from a territory standpoint, and then second, when we just, all of our systems are humming and, you know, everything's dialed in, we'll launch another brand, which is great because franchise owners can actually buy another franchise within our system and be not only a multi-unit owner, but a multi-brand owner. And I, I truly believe if you could build like a, 12 territories in your market, you got a restoration and a plumbing and a roofing or whatever, like these, these brands together, you know, let's say you had, you know, four territories of each, right. And you had a few brands, you could really build a pretty defensible revenue stream and a pretty nice business that you could sell the private equity if you want to as a franchisee, which happens more and, and more. And so we want to leverage, you know, kind of our, our playbooks, if you will, into other, other uh, industries, um, the last thing I'll say on that, um, I think our secret sauce in Voda is intimately understanding that we're a sales organization. And the more we can build a world-class sales organization, meaning the widget is restoration and cleaning. Um, we help our franchise owners just learn how to sell, make them better at sales, focus on lead gen, focus on making the phone ring. And then if we can take all that and teach people how to sell and then you know multiply that across other brands, that's really where we're focused. That's, that's amazing. I, I'm actually, I'm surprised and also a little relieved that you said you're not, you're not even considering about expanding until you've mastered this because you've grown so quickly. I honestly thought you would have said, yeah, we're looking at bringing on three different brands in the next year. So very, very cool that you're, you're focused on doing it the right way from the beginning and making sure your franchisees are set up for success and you, the franchisor and the parent company along the way. So Dan, uh, you did not disappoint. This was, again, a conversation I was looking forward to for a long time. I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, great time. Thanks for having me, Brandon. And for you watching, listening, it's on the screen, myvotafranchise.com. It's also in the show notes wherever you are. Go check out Dan, what he's doing with Voda and Franchise Playbook, and follow along. Become a fan like me. If you're here listening still, make sure you subscribe to Harmonious at Lunch. I love bringing these episodes to you every single day of the week for that bite-sized business advice. We'll see you on the next episode.